automotive companies survive the pandemic. My guest today is Thomas Goldsby. He's a professor and Haslam Chair in Logistics in the Supply Chain Management Department of the University of Tennessee. Hello, Professor Goldsby. Hello, Robert. It's great to be with you again. Thank you. So our topic is automotive. What has been the impact to date of the COVID-19 pandemic on the automotive industry? Well, I think that uh, most industries are experiencing some aspect of bullwhip effect. And uh, that's certainly been witnessed in automotive. Uh, you know, going into the pandemic, I think there was the, the, uh, the general observation was that people were not getting out and about traveling as much. And so you'd expect less demand for uh, newer used automobiles. And then lo and behold, you know, we got into the summer months and people were getting out and about, not necessarily going to work, but going other places and feeling that they didn't want to travel through shared mobility, public transit and so forth. And so uh, personal transportation became very important. And as I understand, both new and used automobiles have just uh, seen incredible demand uh, from that. And so it's been a, a, a very robust V-shaped uh, reaction that they've seen in the marketplace. Uh, and then meanwhile, on the supply side of things, I think we'll talk more about this uh, during the course of our conversation, but uh, it's been very challenging to get products uh, around the nation, let alone around the world. Uh, and when you think about automotive uh, being a, an assembly of 30,000 parts, uh, you know, if you're delayed on any single one of those, it uh, imperils the ability to, to serve that marketplace. Yeah. Can you say where the biggest constraints have been in terms of types of supplies, types of parts, origin of those parts and the like? Well, certainly at the outset, uh, you know, with this pandemic or originating uh, in Wuhan region and, and China, you know, a lot of materials and parts will be sourced from that region. And you'll recall that you know, things were a little bit delayed because of Chinese New Year back in 2020 and then the onset of the pandemic. And so there was a bit of a stumble right out of the gate. And those issues ultimately seem to get re resolved uh, and uh, problems seem to arise elsewhere. Uh, it seemed to be maybe in more complex products. More recently, we're hearing about semiconductors as uh, companies uh, uh, across a lot of different verticals are uh, competing intensely for access to semiconductors just think, for instance, about this past holiday season and the game sales, the, uh, the, the electronic games. You know, they all rely on those semiconductors. And you find that the automotive industry is competing with uh, televisions and uh, video games and all sorts of other smart technologies. Uh, and uh, you find that, uh, you know, when there's a shortage, there needs to be an allocation procedure where those chip makers have to decide who's going to get it. You know, does that chip go into an automobile? Does it go into a PC or game system, what have you? And so we see this intense competition happening across verticals. So uh, the semiconductor example is one that's been gaining a lot of traction lately, as we've heard of the you know, likes of Toyota and other automakers having to slow down production to accommodate. Yeah. And what has been the result in the showroom, so to speak? I mean, does that mean that consumers who are looking to buy cars have been unable to get them, have been on waiting lists, that the product just isn't there? It's, it's possible, uh, depending upon how uh, uh, particular your demands might be. If you're looking for a specific build, um, and, and you might even go to a make-to-order provision on, on a custom build like that, you can probably expect uh, to wait longer for it. Uh, you know, the traditional uh, North American market, though, is to flood the market with um, you know multiple months' worth of inventory, and then to try to match supply and demand with uh, that discounting that happens right there uh, at the dealer location. So maybe, mm -hmm. Robert, you're looking for specific make, model, color, interior. And, uh, you know, before you get very far down that list, even with a, a, a car lot that might have a thousand automobiles, pretty quickly, the likelihood of you matching your specifications to something on that lot gets to be about zero percent. Mm -hmm. um, and so ultimately what the dealers do is they resort to, to discounting. Okay, it's not the right color. It's not got the right uh, styling points. But I'll tell you what, we got this one that's pretty close. Why do you say we mark this down uh, a little bit and, and send you home in this car today? Yeah. Now, if you're, again, a little bit more particular, um, you know, you're going to have to look more widely and perhaps uh, seek that custom build. And you can expect that that's going to be delayed. 
Yeah. Also, we are beginning to see a real uptick in the production and demand for electric vehicles, are we not? That's changing the industry in a very dramatic way. Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, that, that's something that, uh, as you know, Robert, has kind of ebbed and flowed along with fuel prices. As soon as fuel you know, gets over three, four dollars a gallon, people start to think of electric. And what seems to be happening now is people, uh, even with very low fuel prices that we've witnessed, uh, in, in recent years, people are drawn to the electric vehicles uh, and it's getting to be a very proven technology, right? You have to look no further than Tesla, which uh, got a very rare, you know, 100% quality score with an entirely new product when they came out with their Model 6. And so uh, it's only gotten to be more and more uh, in, in demand and in, in fashion, if you will, even without... Uh, skyrocketing fuel prices. Yeah, and of course that creates a potential crisis in the battery supply chain. Uh, there, aren't, there aren't enough batteries to go around to fulfill the demand. Are, is, is that the case? Yeah, no, and, and that's where you know, Tesla is taking the unusual step of, of insourcing you know, mm -hmm. and seeking to own and, uh, that proprietary technology. And that kind of reverses the course of what we've seen for several decades in the automotive industry with very complex products seeking to outsource you know, larger and larger uh, components and sub-assemblies. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, Elon Musk and friends have decided, hey, that's a critical technology. And rather than buy it in the open market and share that technology, let's, let's own it. And so it's been interesting to see how that one company has uh, sought to address. But you're absolutely right. That's, that's a critical um, vulnerability that yeah. we find in many supply chains. What other kinds of changes or innovative solutions uh, are automotive companies undertaking up the supply chain in order to adjust to these changes? And I'm talking specifically about maybe changing sourcing, uh, changing geographies of sourcing, uh, different types of products. I mean, what solutions are they bringing to bear on the problem to the extent that they're even able to do so? Well, for one thing, better understanding who makes up their supply network. Uh, beyond just managing a tier one, better understanding where they might have points of vulnerability at tier two and, and beyond, right back to raw material extraction. As a case in point, you know, something that garnered a lot of attention, and Robert, you and I have spoken about this in the past, is rare earth minerals. Right. And anything that's a smart technology is going to have one of these 16, 17 different rare earth minerals. And companies are much more savvy. Uh, as to, uh, to where those ingredients, if you will, are going into the parts that ultimately go into their automobiles. And I think that uh, this pandemic has only accelerated that need to identify potential weaknesses uh, throughout the supply chain. We are hearing a lot more about not being so dependent on the likes of China. And I, I think there is some overture to maybe uh, multi-source uh, probably not uh, completely remove oneself from China, but to, to be less dependent on that one supply market and diversify a bit more. And, you know, mm -hmm. just as my financial manager tells me, hey, it's always wise to diversify, not put all your eggs in one basket. And I think a lot of companies are realizing that they were perhaps overly dependent uh, on the Chinese market. Uh, so that's something that's being done. And, and that moves right on up to... Um, the OEM assembly locations where we're seeing a lot of innovation around uh, collaborative platforms. Uh, this has been an overture we've seen for some time, you know, the likes of, you know, Mazda and Ford, for instance, building on common platforms and you know, Ford builds an automobile car on it. And Mazda builds a small SUV, what have you. Mm -hmm. But we've seen a lot more of that, that common investment in platforms because it's just so darn expensive to bring a new product to market that we're seeing a lot of horizontal collaboration uh, to go along with the vertical collaboration we've witnessed over the years. Well, that draws on a long-term strategy of automakers. Let's say an automaker like a Ford or GM offers six or seven different models. They are essentially built on the same platform. So there's nothing new about that. But what you're saying is new about it is the collaborative aspect of it between brands or what makes exactly. it interesting and different now? Well, it, as you point out, it's, it's across competitive lines. Mm -hmm. And rather than seeking to vertically integrate, uh, realizing, hey, the, the consumer is expecting more and more innovation. They don't, they're not happy with a platform that might last three to five years. They want uh, some more, uh, maybe even radical changes. You point out, for instance, electric vehicles, which have an incredibly different kind of platform, the conventional combustion engines. 
And so you're seeing a lot of companies decide, hey, we, we see the industry's moving this way, the consumer's directing us there, let's go there together. Uh, and a little bit of reinforcement. Then you got to decide, you know, we've always talked about supplier selectivity. Now you have to decide which competitor you feel comfortable, in essence, going to market with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we talked about the rare earth situation, wanting to perhaps draw on domestics and develop domestic supplies of that. We talked about insourcing batteries for Tesla. What about other parts and components that have up to this point been made, say, in, in China or Asia? Are we seeing or do you expect to see a serious move in reshoring back to the Western Hemisphere, either Mexico and Latin America or actually within the United States itself? Yeah, I think we're going to see more regionalization of supply chains. Uh, and, and, and that means, hey, a car that's built in Asia is directed toward the Asian market. A car built in Europe is going to the European market. North America and so forth. I, I would expect to see more regionalization uh, happening across those lines. And of course, you're gonna to tend to see uh, the, the trade blocks uh, reinforce that as well. We've got NAFTA 2.0, the US, uh, uh, Mexico, Canada agreement that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's uh, recently in place. And I really think that Mexico stands to benefit a lot uh, in serving the North American market. Obviously it's it's been a robust source of supply for, for many decades, including the automotive industry. But I, I think that uh, we're going to see uh, some of those Asian parts perhaps get uh, produced uh, a little closer to home where there's less distance, less uncertainty, and perhaps a little more freight, uh, friendly trade relations. Yeah, interesting. I guess some of this at least is pandemic driven, but I'm assuming that the things we're talking about today are indeed permanent or will be permanent in nature. We will be seeing big changes in automotive supply chains. And Absolutely. I think the changes have only been accelerated. You know, we're hearing yeah. about so the adoption of things that companies might've been thinking, you know, five years into the future and, mm -hmm. and you know, they're just greatly accelerated right now. Professor Thomas Goldsby of the University of Tennessee, always a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you so much for joining me today to talk about the automotive industry and the pandemic and the future of that industry even afterwards. Thanks a lot for being with me today. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Robert. Always a pleasure.